do want to be careful about yeah. is A, is that, is that where I want to go? But also B, is that still going to be relevant in five years? Because if you just really love writing and you love blogging, you're in big freaking trouble. You need to adapt now because <laughs> blogging as you know it is not going to be a thing in five years. I'm telling you already. Alan has started and grown several multi-million dollar businesses. His mission is to help you do the same. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod, building the future one entrepreneur at a time. Hey everyone, welcome to the Business Growth Pod. I'm your host, Alan Draper. Very excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to grow personally, to learn new things. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. Today, I would like to welcome Mark Savant. Mark is the founder of podcast production agency, Mark Savant Media. He specializes in helping thought leaders launch, automate, and grow podcasts. The company has produced tens of thousands of pieces of content and uses podcasts as the engine to power your website, email, social media, and long-form content. He hosts the globally ranked 1%, um, top 1% podcast, After Hours Entrepreneur, and leads dozens of entrepreneurs in the After Hours Entrepreneur Pro community. That's a mouthful. Welcome to the show, Mark. Glad to have you. What's up? What's up? Glad to be here and talk shop, brother. So a lot of people, I mean, podcasts are everywhere. Sometimes there's jokes about like, hey, everybody has a podcast. I Let's kick this off from the entrepreneur's perspective. What's the power of a podcast? Adapting to disruption, I think, is, is the, the main reason. Disruption is happening everywhere. AI, remote work, cryptocurrency, blockchain. Nobody knows what's up or down. Government regulation. like Everything is up in the air right now. And a podcast gives you the unique ob- ability to adapt. And not just adapt secretly in your own little quiet corner, but adapt publicly. We're thought leaders. We're thought leaders. We're not thought followers, okay? And I think that's really important as we go into this disruptive time is adapting change, being loud, and being vocal about it so people say, oh, Alan's Alan's actually at the top of this thing. Alan knows what's going on. Maybe Alan's the guy to talk to in my industry because Alan has been adapting new AI, adapting new tools. And, and also collaborating with AI producers, developers, app developers, SaaS developers. The world is about to get turned on its head. And there's going to be a lot of jobs that don't exist in five years. There's going to be a lot of jobs in five years that you never even heard of. So by being on top of these trends loudly and vocally through a podcast, you position yourself to be irreplaceable in your industry. You know, I... I didn't really aspire to start a podcast. It happened during COVID. I'm not, I don't have the background that some people I associate with have. They were in radio, they were in other forms of media, but I think it was exactly what you're talking about. I had something to say. I had a specific business niche that I wanted to help out and I just ran with it. And what's funny, Mark, is that Like I'll talk to people that reach out to me. I'll talk to them on the phone or whatever. They're looking for some help with their business. And they'll say, they'll make comments like, oh, it's so funny, like talking to you because they recognize my voice and it's different than my social media content. There's, because they feel like, even though this is my very first time talking to this individual, they feel like they know me. And when we're developing a brand especially with companies and developing a brand takes years. It's very difficult. And I'm still obviously on, on my way. It's not a done, done deal yet, but you know, that is kind of the upper echelon of marketing is ha- is having a brand and podcasting, I think is so, I think it's so beneficial for, you know, that endeavor. Now you mentioned you, some really interesting things, some really thought provoking things like made me really curious about what you were talking about. Specifically, there's going to be jobs that exist now that no longer exist in the future, that there are going to be jobs that exist in the future that don't exist now. Let's talk about that. What are you getting at with that comment? Well, AI specifically, but there's a lot of different technology that's happening. It's completely changed the game. It's, I mean, everything is different. I'll give you a personal example of how I got into AI. So 
I run a podcast agency, as you'd mentioned, and I had a team member who was writing show notes. We produced the show and he'd go in and he'd type out all these show notes and these descriptions and, and all this information after the show was done. And he ended up leaving the company, going to a university and, and moving on to the next phase of his life. And I was kind of stuck holding the bag. Oh crap, I've got clients, I've got work to do. And so I started writing out all these show notes and I was like, damn, this is taking me a long time. Hmm. It's taking me a long time. So I started looking for solutions. And one of the solutions that I had found at the time was using AI programs to help me take the transcription from that podcast episode and then take that transcription and use AI to write out a summary and to write out interesting keywords and titles and emails and start to write all this written work. And, and guess what? It was pretty good. Hmm. It was actually really good. And so what, what's happened here with just this idea of using AI to write creative word is it's completely transformed every industry. You might see that Hollywood is on strike right now. They're worried about AI and they're worried about streaming. Hmm. Because why the hell am I going to pay millions of dollars to a group of 20 people to write show scripts when I can hire maybe one or two that are using AI to develop tons of different creative ideas and then you just have one or two people that siphon through those and and work out the best. So writers as we know it, gone. I mean, we could get into it. I'm, I'm actually releasing a video today about AI influencers. There are AI influencers that have millions of followers, millions of dollars in net worth, and they're not even real influencers. It's just an Instagram image. And then that gets converted into video. Like I, we could go on and on. There's, But this is, I think, the tip of the iceberg. This is what's happening right now that I'm seeing in our industry, which is which is interesting because if you're in a written, if you're doing a lot of writing, your job is big time at risk, hmm. big time at risk because you're, you're overpaid and I can hire a 20 year old Malaysian kid to do it be probably better than you can. And it's the, the whole landscape of that job role has changed. So when you're talking about outsourcing overseas and things like that, are those folks using AI? hundred percent. And, and I think that's another key, a key function here, Alan, because historically hiring someone to do creative work, like we'll just use copywriting right now. Cause I think that's a very good example. Sure. Copywriting is very difficult, especially in English. English is a tough language to write in. Heck, most Americans can't even write well in English, <laughs> but using AI, you can take a level two copywriter and turn them to a level eight or nine copywriter writer like that. Hmm. And there's been, you know, what's, what's going to end up happening is all these people in the middle who are picking up these odd jobs on Fiverr, there's just not going to be as many jobs available because the people that are using AI to write copy are going to be able to write 10 times faster and more accurately than people that are not. Hmm. So what about the people that say that AI is evil, it's taking jobs, it's bad for the economy, it's bad for, you know the the labor sector what what do you say to them well i mean ch change is inevitable like if you look mm -hmm. look back to human history has there ever been a point where new technology came forth and then a lot of jobs were phased out sure i'll give you an example we'll go back to the invention of the automobile before the automobile there was horse and buggy and there were people mm -hmm. scraping up crap off the ground and training horses and making horseshoes and in all you know there were uh, horseshoe drivers, horse drivers, I don't even know what you would call them. They don't exist anymore because we all have automobiles, which led to mechanics and in different types of work. So yeah, that, the world in five years is, is going to be irrecognizable to where we're at right now in 2023, because there's going to be so many jobs that have been phased out and there's going to be a lot of new jobs that have come together. And again, I think this is why podcasting, adapting, change, and being vocal is really important. Yeah, Mark, I think that's a very interesting point, this concept of how different types of people react to change in different ways. And it's a common theme, kind of, it's commonly understood that more millionaires are made during down economies than at any other time. And what that means is that there's this opportunity that's created, that difficulty or change creates opportunity and the folks that have this abundance mentality, like as opposed to, hey, I'm going to go hide in a cave, they're going to take it on. They're going to embrace it. They're going to embrace AI. They're going to learn about it, even though it's difficult. 
It's a little foreign to me. I'm still learning about it, trying to understand how to apply it to my businesses. But it's those types of people that are going to be able to do really well with what AI is going to do to change all industries. That being said, for a content creator, for a podcast, or people that are trying to get their voice out there, where do you recommend that they start with AI? What do they start doing to employ it to make their lives easier? Well, so it, it depends on your organization. It depends on your goals, depends on your industry. The, the best place to start is probably with ChatGPT. It's very simple. Only 15% of the world has actually heard of ChatGPT, by the way. So if- Did you say if you, 50 or 15? 15, one five. Wow. One five. So there's a lot of people that have never even heard of ChatGPT despite its popularity. But ChatGPT is a great place to start because simply using it as an assistant or an advisor Mm -hmm. can make you very dangerous. So I'll give you a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Using it to, to formulate ideas. So let's say, for example, you're stuck on a project, you're not exactly sure where to start, and you can just ask, hey, ChatGPT, you know, I need to land 10 clients for my, my business. I want them to be local to the Fort Lauderdale area. Who are some, who are, where should I start? And you, you know, of course you explain to ChatGPT what your business is, who you're looking for. ChatGPT will give you 20 different businesses, 50 different businesses, a mm. hundred different businesses in your local area. It'll give you emails. It'll give you websites. It'll give you a great place to start your outreach. It'll even give you a script. So, mm. you know, just using it as a way to solve the problems that you run into on a day by day basis is a really good place to start. And as you get more familiar with it, as you get more comfortable, you can even start to automate chat GPT into your everyday systems. It's an open AI software. So you can start to integrate it automatically using simple programs like Zapier, which are very hmm. popular. So th you can get dangerous with chat GPT. You know, I think it's a really good point to kind of compare AI to other forms of technology. You were talking about, you know, the vehicle and what that did to horses or how we were, you know, commuting and how we were traveling in the past. And I think the real winners are going to be the folks that, as I mentioned before, they adapt, they accept it, but they find out the human element. Where does the human interaction really come into play with AI? And how does that 10x what it already is. And you kind of mentioned that using it to, you know, start brainstorming. And the the limited use that I have with it is very similar. I don't um, you know, type something in a chat GPT and just copy and paste it. It's usually, you know, I've used it to prepare for podcasts. I've used it to create lists. Like I I um did a solo episode a couple of months ago about, you know, the top 10 reasons why businesses fail. And so I type that into chat GPT. I start there and then I add my experience to it. And I think that's where people can really benefit from it. Do, are, are you on the same page with me on with, with that, where you think that it's not in the current phase, the current stage where it's a copy and paste type system? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. I love it for the idea, the idea formulation. You know, if, if I'm launching a new show for a client, for example, I'll mm -hmm. do my keyword research. I'll look for search research, volume, competition. I'll give that information to ChatGPT and I'll say, hey, give me 50 potential titles. And out of those 50, I'll pick two or three. And I'll mm -hmm. say, let's expand on these. Give me another 50 for these two or three and continue to break those down. Historically, mm -hmm. just coming up with creative names for shows is very, very difficult. ChatGPT just makes it much, much easier if, if you know the right criteria. Um, you know, the, the flip side though, is there's a lot that you can do. This is something I'm looking at very closely. I'm speaking to several different developers on softwares that can scrape profiles. Let's take LinkedIn, for example, you could scrape the LinkedIn profile and then use that information to create custom DMs and custom emails to reach out to. So it could be something like, Hey, Alan, Love the business podcast that you've produced. It looks like you're hmm. helping business owners and creatives and startups. This is how we can work together. You know, so looking at ways to use AI to look at, you know, just do a complete assessment of who you're reaching out to and then create custom messages at scale 
automated, that's something that's really exciting to me in creating better lead gen, as it were. I think that's incredible that it's you're using technology in a replicable manner to create messaging that's specific. And for somebody like me that gets spammed quite a bit, especially on LinkedIn, with those, you know, you can tell they're just canned emails or canned messages that they just blast them out to everybody. And to be frank, I, I have my own messaging that I send out to people on LinkedIn, sure. but I haven't added that touch. I haven't added that AI touch where it could, you know, be more specific, mention somebody's specific business or how long they've been there or whatever. And that's, I think that's a really interesting variation. Yeah. And listen, if you're not be... doing it, it, well, I just want to say, if you're not doing a direct outreach, you're doing something wrong, you're being negligent. So the fact that you're doing that is great. The, the question is, if your open rate or your response rate is, let's say 5% now, mm -hmm. well, maybe that AI customization brings you up to an eight to nine to a 10%, which is a big deal mm -hmm. in your lead gen. That's awesome. Shifting gears just a little bit. How are you using AI with the consulting portion of your business? Uh, so how do you mean, as far as the consulting, how do you mean by that Just question? Kind of on the advising side, helping other businesses, like things like that. Right. Well, typically how I'm working with business owners, I'm working with people that are in podcasting and media production, because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as someone who's using a lot of different AI generation tools, a lot of new tech, like the industry is changing all the time using programs like Descript and CapCut and CastMagic and Swell and Video.ai and then Adobe Premiere Pro has a bunch of AI add-ons and then ChatGPT and those add-ons uh, and you know, some of the other ones that are in the pipeline right now from developers. What I really focus on is how do we automate this podcast as much as possible? How do we create? Because at the end of the day, a lot of podcasts fail. People say, you know, oh, everybody has a podcast. Well, not really. There's actually only a few hundred thousand that are in everyday regular production. So there's actually mm. not that many shows out there. And the reason for that, Alan, is because people underestimate the amount of work that it takes to put into it. Yes. And, and that's the problem that, that I aim to solve is say, hey, how do we cut out all the friction? How do we make it easier? I'll, I'll give you an example. When someone books to be on my show, they fill out a calendar link. The calendar automatically... Uh, the calendar link automatically sends them follow-up emails to remind them. It automatically sets up the, the Riverside Studio, which is what we're using here. That's what I used to. It automatically sets up the Riverside Studio for them and reminds them. Automatically sets up the calendar and reminds them. But I've even added an additional level layer on top of that, by the way. Because just by automating your onboarding process, you save a bunch of time. But another thing that I've done is I've integrated Calendly with ChatGPT using Zapier automatically. So as soon as you've scheduled, it's going to set up a Google folder. It's going to set up a Google form inside that folder that's going to give me a list of potential questions for that guest. So it even helps me to expedite my research process. It's pretty remarkable. You know, I think one of the challenges that entrepreneurs face, especially in the early days, as they have so many things going on, is you know, this idea of automating the things that can easily or should be automated and spending the time with, you know, direct involvement, in the things that shouldn't. And yes. just generally as an entrepreneur, where do you draw that line? Is it for you? Is it a matter of, hey, does it make sense to use technology? Is there no personal touch that, that is required from this? Or is there something more involved in, in making that decision? Well, I mean, I look to reduce clicks and friction at every level, it, all the time, you know, and, and people, I, I think we sometimes romanticize that human touch uh, to an extent. And I don't want to say that it's not important. I mean, calling hmm. people on the phone out of nowhere, recording custom videos and messages. I think that stuff is important, but, you know, I think, you know, we, we, we kind of, like I said, romanticize this idea that, oh, it has to be me. It has to be my authentic self. When in the reality, you know, 
a lot of this stuff that you're 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 putting your authentic authenticness behind your authenticity behind it's, mm-hmm. nobody cares anyway right like most people aren't going to stop and read your three paragraph four paragraph five paragraph instagram post they just want to see the picture they just want to see the video your time you could have bought yourself 20 minutes of time which could have been more focused on something else so you know using ai and using tech to buy back time allows you to actually implement the human touch where it matters on the sales call on the customer service call not on all this lead generation stuff which is just a big numbers game anyway i love that idea that you know using technology and setting up systems allows you to spend time where you actually need to where the roi is actually there and I think it's a matter, especially for entrepreneurs, to break down these barriers and these walls. We come into business with preconceived notions about how things should be, and especially startups. And I went through this phase, and to some extent, I'm still doing so, where I think that there are certain tasks that only I can do, right? And in Mm. my mind, it's like, hey, if I don't do it, then it's not going to get done properly or whatever. Everything's going to fall apart, right? And I recently read a book that talks about controlling your time. It's called Buy Back Your Time, Dan Martell, fantastic book. And in that book, he says something to the extent of, if something is done by somebody else and they do it 80%, that's better than you doing it at 100%. And I think this principle that you just mentioned, I think it applies here where it's like, you know, we, we romanticize this idea, like you said, of the entrepreneur being involved at every stage. And it's just really tough to scale like that. It's really tough to have the impact and the reach that you want to have. If you're currently, you know, bogged down in the technical aspects of your work, some business owners, for example, a baker. They just love that technical aspect of, you know, baking the brownies, baking the cookies, whatever. And it's like, that's fine if that's what you want to do. If you're a writer, like if you want to reserve that. But if that's the case, what you're trading is scale and other opportunity. Because if you're doing that 40, 50 hours a week, you don't have the opportunity to grow and and do these other things. So if you want to scale a business, apply exactly what Mark is saying. Use these tools. I think it's really cool that you said you use them as much as you can, but use them and break down these walls of, you know, like this, you know, required personal interaction when it's just not necessary. What does somebody go through, Mark, to identify those things when it's necessary and when it's not? Or are we just like, hey, if there's a way to systematize this, then they're probably not necessary. Well, you know, for me, at least there's trial and error and I'm very upfront. I mean, this is part of the value of having a podcast and a platform. I'm very loud. I'm very vocal that I'm using AI. So mm-hmm. if someone messages me and said, Hey, what's this about? I'll be like, Oh, you know, I'm trying out this new software. What was your experience? Like, again, the value of being loud and vocal about trying new things is, you know, you're going to make mistakes and people will understand it. But guess what? Because you're, you're, I mean, this is entrepreneurship 101, right? You're going to have to make mistakes if you're going to grow your damn business. Mm -hmm. You can't just sit back and do the same thing that worked 10 years ago. Not only is it not going to work, what got you to where you're at today is not what's going to get you to the next level. And, and, you know, I also think, so I just finished reading this book, Predictable Success, and there's this this big part of this book that talks about, um, you know, is do you actually want to scale up your business because more money, more problems? more bureaucracy, more leaders, Mm -hmm. more team members, more systems. So, you know, if you kind of vision this out and spoken to your spouse about it and decided where you want to go, nothing wrong with being that baker that's doing that Mm -hmm. 50, 60 hours a week, like Mazel What you do want to be careful about is A, is that that where I want to go? But also B, is that still going to be relevant in five years? Because if you just really love writing and you love blogging, you're in big freaking trouble. You need to adapt now because <laughs> blogging as we know it is not going to be a thing in five years. I'm telling you already, it is not. And, and that goes, you actors, I'm not, you're not going to be, hi- you're going to be hiring like maybe a Tom Cruise and then all the rest are going to be just these body doubles with superimposed deep fake faces. You're not going to need 
a director to go out and film a giant explosion scene because you're going to be able to generate that with AI and it's going to be amazing. So you need to start thinking about where is this train going? Because I don't want to be the one who falls off the cliff. And if you have a podcast, if you have that platform, if you're connected with people that in your industry, they're thinking a step ahead. That to me is the safest place to be because we just don't know exactly where this thing is going. Love it. That's such a great point. And I think it's just, it's a principle that that I believe uh, I believe in. You got to adapt to change. Change is where the opportunities are. You know, um, I remember when people said that email was going to go away, and <laughs> they just never got on board with it. And it's still, you know, a lot of how businesses transacted. So, well, this conversation has been fantastic, man. It's very, very enlightening. It's cool to talk about technology in a way that has these underlying principles that affect different areas of, of business. Mark, where can people go if they want to learn more about what you're doing, they want to reach out or they have a question for you? Yeah, if you're ready to amplify your brand, you go to marksavantmedia.com, marksavantmedia.com. We're making the next generation of thought leaders. We're helping them launch, automate, and grow podcasts at marksavantmedia.com. Love it. Couldn't recommend you any more highly. Thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. And I wish you nothing but success. Thank you, Alan. If you have enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time. <laughs>